Pops kicked the bucket. Ha, you're going to some facility starting tomorrow, my son said to me coldly as I was engulfed in grief. Not a terror for his father's death. His face bore an unpleasant smirk. Don't worry, though. We'll properly inherit all of Dad's estate and house. What is he even talking about? The first time we meet in ages, and this is what it's about. His wife seems to be completely on board with inheriting everything, too. They barely showed their faces before, but now they turn up just for this. I'd never let you two inherit anything. I'm Holly, married for 40 years now. We've got to start saving for our retirement, my husband would say. Indeed, I hear we need about $1.3 million for it, I'd agree. We've been having these conversations lately. We have savings from our hard work, so we won't be struggling immediately, but the worries never end. It's not like we have no one to turn to in an emergency. We have a son, Kevin, but we haven't seen him in nearly 10 years. What's Kevin doing now? Who knows? But there's no point hoping for much from an absent son. We'd like to rely on our son, but we can't depend solely on him for our future, especially with potential care needs. Despite various worries, we've managed to get by on our own. Then one weekday afternoon, the doorbell rang. I thought it was a delivery, but the monitor showed my son. He looked different from when I last saw him 10 years ago, with a roughened air about him. Hey, it's Kevin. I exclaimed in surprise to my husband, who was just as shocked. Kevin, really? As I rushed to open the door, there stood Kevin and an unfamiliar woman. Who was this flashy dressed woman? My mind raced with questions, but Kevin, unfazed, stepped in and called the woman over. What's this all of a sudden? What's going on? Well, actually, I'm getting married to her. Married? After a long absence, he brought one surprise after another, leaving my husband and me speechless. Then, the woman with Kevin spoke up. Nice to meet you, I'm Sophie. Just like that. And as I thought they'd come in, they seemed ready to leave after a brief greeting. Wait, after so long? Can't we talk a bit more? I didn't plan to hold them long, but I wanted to talk more with my son's fiancé. Sophie, was it? Please, take good care of Kevin. Um, I'm going to marry Kevin, but I have no intention of becoming part of your family. That's what she firmly told me when I spoke to her. My husband and I were dumbfounded and couldn't say anything as the two of them left. Given such a response, it's impossible not to feel anxious about the future. Our reunion with our son only amplified our worries. Half a year has passed since Kevin and Sophie got married. They never showed their faces even once since that marriage introduction. We're worried, but as long as our son and his wife are happy, that's all that matters. My husband and I tried to put our son out of our minds with that thought. Then, Kevin began contacting us occasionally. While it should have been a joy to hear from our son, the content of his calls was concerning. Hey, I'm a bit short on cash. Can you send me $1,000? I'll send you the account details later. It was always about money. He never showed any consideration for us, just one-way demands, and not just once, but several times a month. We knew this situation wasn't good. We wanted Kevin to stand on his own two feet, but our concern for our only son made us give in, and after discussing it, we complied with his requests. I wish he would be a bit smarter with his money, we'd say. The early days of marriage are expensive, and we hardly did anything for him when he was young. This is partly our responsibility, my husband would add. For a while, we continued to provide funds to Kevin, but recently, he started calling almost daily asking for money. We realized that if this continued, we wouldn't be able to sustain our own lives. One day, I decided to tell Kevin that we couldn't provide any more assistance. Calling out of the blue, what is it? I have something to discuss. About money, what? You're calling to say you'll transfer money? No, that's not it. We can't send any more money. We have our own lives to live. Fine, whatever. His response was surprisingly calm. 
I thought we'd finally reached an understanding, but my relief was short-lived. Within an hour after ending the call, an angry Kevin stormed into our house. Hey, my life is a mess because of you guys. It's your fault I dropped out in middle school. It's all the parents' responsibility, right? If you can't give money, then whatever happens is fine, right? Kevin was the very image of a delinquent. It's true that both my husband and I were too busy with work when he was young and didn't spend enough time with him. Letting him go now might lead to serious trouble. Fearing his angry gaze, I had no choice but to comply. All right, how much do you need? Head, that's up to how you feel. It pained my heart to realize how much our son resented us. For the time being, I handed him the $100 I had in my wallet. $100, you're joking, right? No, this is all I can do, really. Saying this, I showed Kevin my bank statement. This was the account I used for living expenses, not the one for savings, so it didn't contain much money. Moreover, it was just before my pension was due, so there was hardly anything left in it. Is that so? Kevin pocketed the $100 he received and left with those words. After this incident, perhaps thinking he couldn't expect any more money from us, the calls from Kevin demanding money stopped. I thought now, at last, we could live a peaceful retirement. That was until my husband was soon diagnosed with colorectal cancer. The doctor said even with treatment, recovery wasn't expected, only like hospice care. I wanted him to live as long as possible, but he didn't feel the same. I've had enough. If there's no hope of recovery, don't waste money. Think of your future and save the money. Persuaded by my husband, I decided to let him spend his final days as he wished. A month later, he passed away swiftly. You did well. This is for the best. Losing my beloved husband, I was immersed in deep sorrow. The only consolation was that he spent his last moments peacefully, without showing any pain. Preparations for the funeral began immediately, but my role was only to contact people from a list my husband had prepared before he passed away. It included names of old friends and colleagues, and our son Kevin. When I informed him of his father's death, his response was indifferent. How cold-hearted, I thought with a sigh. On the day of the funeral, the service went smoothly. Many people came to offer their condolences, but there was no sign of my son and his wife. I didn't expect them to bother showing up, but as I was greeting the mourners, I saw Kevin and his wife arrive, both dressed in casual, almost loungewear-like sweats. Unbelievable, I ignored them, but they approached me. So the old men's finally kicked the bucket, huh? You should just go into a care home from tomorrow, was the first thing out of Kevin's mouth. My anger peeked at his smirking face and the suggestion of a care home. Just as I was about to retort, my daughter-in-law, Sophie, spoke up. Don't worry, we'll properly inherit the estate in the house. What on earth were they thinking? There's no inheritance for you to receive, I replied. They hardly ever showed their faces. Yet here they were, making decisions as if it was their right. I felt like lashing out in anger, but I couldn't do such a thing at my husband's funeral. We'll talk later. For now, just offer your incense. Trying to suppress my trembling voice, I told them quietly. Then I heard someone speak. Same as always, he said. It was Mr. Smith, an old friend of my husband's and apparently a lawyer. He might know something about the inheritance issue. When I briefly explained the situation, he promised to stand with me to disinherit Kevin. I've decided to let my son and his wife know all about the humiliation my husband and I have endured. After the ceremony ended and all the mourners had left, only Mr. Smith, my son and his wife, and I remained at the funeral parlor. Dad left a $2 million inheritance, right? Give it to us quickly, my son demanded, smirking as usual, while Sophie looked on expectantly. They must think they'll receive the inheritance, but I have no such intention. I asserted clearly, you won't be getting any inheritance, that's impossible. 
Kevin, taken aback by my words, confronted me angrily. What? You're joking, right? That's impossible. You can't do that. I replied, you think it's not allowed. Why don't we confirm with Mr. Smith here? Either way, I've left the inheritance matters to him. It's out of my hands. Kevin dismissively retorted, what are you even saying? I don't care about some irrelevant old man. I was deeply ashamed of the vulgar language and regretted raising a son like this, especially arguing about inheritance right after his father's funeral. Disgusted with his attitude, I asked Mr. Smith to explain to my son. Please explain, Mr. Smith, I requested. Of course, Kevin, do you remember me? He asked. I don't know you. Who the hell are you? Kevin responded aggressively. Mr. Smith remained calm, undisturbed. That's a shame. We used to play together when you were little. Kevin, uninterested in past memories, demanded, So what? You're going to talk about Dad's estate, right? I'm the one who will inherit it. When Kevin returned to the topic of inheritance, Mr. Smith's eyes sharpened, Kevin, you have no right to inherit. What? What nonsense are you spouting, Kevin? Remember your delinquent behavior as a teenager that involved the police? And as an adult, you accumulated a significant debt without your mother's knowledge, which your father repaid. I know everything. I had just learned this fact from Mr. Smith, who offered to help with the inheritance because of this knowledge. I was aware of Kevin's past misdeeds, but I had no idea about the massive debt he created without my knowledge, which my husband had to cover. So what? It's a parent's duty to take care of their child. Besides, there's no doubt I'm his son, so I naturally have a right to the inheritance. Kevin argued approaching Mr. Smith in a rage, with Sophie similarly furious. It's impossible that Kevin doesn't have any inheritance rights. Everyone knows a person's own child would have rights. Are you even a liar? Or is that just a lie? Their loud arguments caused the security guards at the funeral parlor to rush over in a panic. Is there a problem here? A guard asked, trying to calm them down as he approached me for details. Embarrassed to involve others, I apologized. I'm sorry, it's just a family dispute. We truly didn't mean to cause any trouble. While I apologized deeply to the guard, Kevin and Sophie continued to resist. Let go, what do you think you're doing? Ouch, that hurts, stop it old man. Their disrespectful behavior finally made me lose my temper. Enough, your attire and behavior are inappropriate for a funeral. You're causing a scene and disturbing everyone around. Knock it off, I was aware my voice was getting louder. The couple, who hadn't expected me to get this angry, quieted down suddenly. Then Mr. Smith whispered to me, don't worry, there's no way Kevin will inherit. Your father prepared a contingency plan. A contingency plan? I wasn't sure what he meant, but Mr. Smith continued, Holly, it's time to confront Kevin with the hardship he's caused you. He potted my back reassuringly. I couldn't indulge my son's selfishness any longer and began to approach them calmly. Enough already, I said. What? That's my line. All this could end if you just agree to let me inherit. Kevin retorted. I've told you countless times it's impossible for you to inherit. I replied, moving closer with each step. Noticing my approach, Kevin's face turned pale. You come here, to your father's funeral, with a disrespectful attitude after causing trouble for others all your life. You truly have no respect for your parents, I said coldly, glaring at him. No, but, that's because of you too. You were never home when I was a kid, Kevin protested. Always making excuses when cornered, aren't you? Yes, we weren't home, and I regret that. But many kids grow up in similar situations and don't live their lives blaming their parents. It's pathetic to rely on your parents even as an adult, I said. Kevin trembled silently, head bowed. Whether from anger or sorrow, I couldn't tell. But he was listening, and it was time to resolve this situation. Mr. Smith, 
Please use the last resort you mentioned earlier. What this last resort entailed remained a mystery, but it seemed the only way to break through the current situation. Responding to my call, Mr. Smith handed me an envelope. Inside was something called a final judgment certificate of inheritance. What's this? I was perplexed by the document I was seeing for the first time. What does it mean? Both Kevin and Sophie looked on curiously. What is this paper all about? As Kevin, who had been cornered, began to show a defiant attitude again, Mr. Smith quietly began to explain. Actually, your father had filed a court petition during his lifetime, stating that he did not want Kevin to inherit any of his estate. This document is proof that his petition was accepted. What? Kevin and Sophie were clearly shaken. I too was completely unable to grasp the situation. When did all this happen? Your father had asked me to keep it a secret from you, Holly. Now that he has passed away, I believed it was the right time to hand this document to you. My husband. What does this mean? Explain this. Yes, of course. Mr. Smith went on to explain. Normally, a husband's estate would be inherited by his spouse and son, but under certain circumstances, one can apply to disinherit a specific person. This is apparently called disinheritance. So, you're saying my father decided to exclude me from the inheritance? Why would he do that? Can't this just be ignored? This was the first time I learned such a measure existed. My husband had gone to great lengths to ensure Kevin would not inherit. Unfortunately, it can't be ignored. It has been legally recognized by the court, and the procedure is legally valid. Besides, considering the amount of debt Kevin has caused your father over the years, it's only natural he would want to avoid inheritance. I hadn't asked how much debt Kevin had amassed. How much financial burden had my fully son placed on his father? Excuse me, how much debt did my son leave for my husband to cover? It's $40,000. Your husband said if his son was going to demand money from him every month, he'd rather pay it off himself. It was supposed to be under the agreement that Kevin would repay it, but in the end, Kevin broke that promise, and your husband was very angry. I couldn't believe he had done such a thing. I sought confirmation from Kevin, but he remained silent. That silence said it all. If you're going to be silent, then fine. Just leave. I never want to see either of you again, and you've understood by now that you won't be inheriting anything. But isn't there at least a little something I can get? With that remark, my patience snapped. I said leave, you ungrateful son. With this, our ties are severed. Never come to see me again. Frightened by my scolding, Kevin and Sophie hurriedly left the room. The last I saw of him was him stumbling in his haste and falling to the floor. Mr. Smith, thanks to you, I was saved. Thank you so much. Not at all. This was your husband's last wish. Now, you can live in peace. Thanks to Mr. Smith's support, I was able to protect my late husband's inheritance. If I hadn't met him at the funeral, I might have been forced into a facility, at the mercy of those two. Kevin never changed, right up to the end. I no longer consider him my son. He has a wife. They should just live their own lives. I plan to ensure he inherits nothing from me. With these thoughts, I left the funeral after parting with Mr. Smith. A week after my husband's funeral, while I was sorting through his belongings, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, is this Ms. Holly? It was the police. What could have happened? May I help you? Yes. You have a son named Kevin, right? Two children were found in a flat under his name and have been taken into protective custody. I was stunned. What's the situation? And these children? Are they my sons? Despite my confusion, the officer continued. We're also searching for Kevin's whereabouts but haven't found him yet. Could you please come to the station? I'll be right there, I replied. Could they be relatives' children, or are they really my sins? As I arrived at the station, filled with speculation, I knew the moment I saw the children. 
They were Kevin's kids. They looked about two years old, resembling Kevin when he was young. It seems no birth certificates were filed, probably due to financial issues. The landlord reported them after finding debt collection letters scattered near the children. They were probably abandoned during a midnight escape. It's a heartbreaking situation for such little ones. They've done nothing wrong. Would you consider a care facility for them? No, that won't be necessary. I'll take them in. I immediately responded to the officer's question. Since then, I've been struggling with the demands of child care but living fulfilling days with the children. Years have passed since I took them in, and there's been no word from my son and his wife. I have no idea what's become of them. Your father might be gone, or he might be living somewhere else. But we won't see him again. I keep telling the children this, and they seem to understand. Being abandoned by their parents must have left a deep wound in their hearts. Regardless, I am firmly committed to supporting and watching over these children as they grow.